<clears throat> well, what is wrong with you guys? Why are you coming to a worship workshop on discipleship? That's the, uh, that's the stuff that, unfortunately, our culture is known for not really doing. So I don't know why you guys are even here. You guys are weird. Uh, awesome. Before we get started, I want to uh, shout out. We got a uh, special guest. My own father is in the house, Brent Culver, the patriarch. Brother Brenaham, uh, yeah, my dad is, he's a pastor in upstate New York, uh, a church called Life Church. They're actually part of our Radiant Network and part of another network called uh, Elam, and uh, super honored to have him here, and uh, I just, really early memories, even my uh, young teen years of coming downstairs at 5 a.m., and my dad shouting his head off in the living room because he was on a water fast, just interceding and praying and dragged me to Toronto, you know, when I was a 10-year-old and I was absolutely freaked out. Cause it was just, if, if you're not familiar with the, the Toronto blessing, it was an outpouring that happened there. <clears throat> There's just bodies flying, people screaming, crying. I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening, um, but it was there actually the Lord really got a hold of me when I was about 13, 14, so... Yep, just wanted to honor him. Thanks for being here, Dad. Awesome. Well, uh, I was kind of half joking about uh, what's what's wrong with you uh, being here on a workshop about discipleship because um, I, I I this this topic and this this theme has been something as a church that the Lord has really been developing and and downloading, um, and. Uh, <clears throat> Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew 28. Go into a little bit of my story, but I feel like the Lord gave me one pretty clear word that I want to dive into. Um, <clears throat> but I want to just start reading the scripture. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You'll be familiar with this passage most likely. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Uh, let's pray just before we, we dive in. Holy Spirit, <clears throat> we ask that you would open our eyes and open our ears. I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you would, <clears throat> not through my words or teaching, but through your Holy Spirit, Lord, I ask that you would bring absolutely insane clarity. God, I ask for areas and on our worship teams and people that we are discipling and leading that has been a burden of heaviness, Lord, where we have carried burdens that were not ours to carry, Lord, I ask that there would be a releasing. God, I ask where there has been confusion and discouragement, I ask that it would be replaced with hope and faith and absolute clarity. <clears throat> In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> amen. It's uh, it's funny, you know, we call this the Great Commission, um, but it's not just the Great Commission, it's the only commission that Jesus actually gives us. It's the only commission, and uh, Jesus does not say, go into all the earth and build super sick worship ministries. Go into all the earth and write really cool music. It doesn't say go into all the earth it says, go into all the earth and make disciples. And I'm not saying that because those things don't matter. I'm saying that because Jesus is a man of order. And in the kingdom, sometimes we like to think that everything is just kind of all the same. 
and there's no order to how things work. But in Christ, there's always order and there's always headship. Things always flow from one place. There is a Christ is the head and things flow underneath that. There's not 90 million great commandments. He says, listen, there's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's called the first commandment. It means it's number one. It means that if it is out of place, then it's not even the, the right order. And Jesus is saying here, now, of course, there's a billion great things that we can do because I'm not saying that to dog worship ministry or ministry. Obviously, I'm a part of that. I give my life to it. But we can get out of order and out of focus when we see our worship or our ministry being anything outside of making disciples. And uh, what he says here, all of, Jesus is like, I have all authority, but I'm willing to give you that authority for you to walk in that earth. But in order for you to actually walk in that authority, you actually have to go and make disciples and teach them to observe all I've commanded you. And, and, and the reality is, <clears throat> for you and for me, unfortunately, we elevate our calling and our gifts and our talents so far beyond this call. And we, we put making disciples far the way down the list, but the reality is we dream and we fantasize about the stage and success and things working really well. And things, none, of these, none of these things that are bad, but, but in our own hearts, we're, we're out of order with Jesus' command to make disciples. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I honestly, I think every single person relates to feeling that, that, uh, that desire for calling above disciples. You know, I remember being, you know, 18 years old when I moved to the International House of Prayer to go to Bible school. And, and when, I, when I looked at the trajectory of my life, what I wanted to do, I was like, well, God gifted me and, and gave me musical gifts. And, you know, I want to do music and I want to make music and I want to write music and I want to write worship songs. And, and, and the Lord had spoken a lot of prophetic promises about worship. And, you know, even as a teenager, the Lord's like, you're going to, your, your music is going to go before millions. You're going to lead the nations and all that. And it's, again, it's like a very Joseph <laughs> type scenario where we then are like, awesome. Yeah, we're really awesome. And we're going we're gonna to make this happen. And, and, and God's like, yeah, we are going to make this happen, but it's not going to look anything like <laughs> you want it to look. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I really started pursuing music and, uh, and writing and, <clears throat> and, uh, and I really wasn't discipling and mentoring anybody. And, and uh, I had a, a leader uh, when I was about 20, it's probably about 21 years old. And, uh, and he came to me and said, hey, we have, in, in Kansas City, he's like, hey, we have, we want to start a youth camp uh, for teenagers to come and learn worship. And I was like, oh, man, that's really cool. And he's like, what do you think about running it? And I like, of course, I laugh and, and say, that's, that's really funny. I, I like that joke. But who are you really thinking? And he's like, well, what about you? And, and, and I was like, I'm 21 years old. Can you imagine, like, parents dropping their teenager off? And they're like, hey, little guy, where's the leader of this camp? I'm like, oh, it's, that's me, actually. <clears throat> actually. Uh, and I just had visions of, like, these parents, like, looking at me absolutely terrified. And, 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 uh, and I was like, man, I don't... Uh, I literally said this. I was like, man, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if I'm called to, to really disciple. I, I feel called to, to do worship and lead worship. And, and uh, you know, I'm a 21-year-old. I don't even know that, you know, I'm in massive violation uh, of Scripture. And uh, this, leader was <laughs> this leader was really, really kind to me. But, but he said, you know, Caleb, you, he's like, you can continue to grow and develop as a worship leader, as a songwriter and do music. He's like, and I, and I believe you'll... you'll You'll fulfill those prophecies. I believe you'll you'll write great music. You'll you'll have influence and impact. And you might even have songs that go in front of millions. Um, but you can do that with your life, and that's great. Or you can be a father to the next generation, and you can see a harvest happen. And at the end of your life, you can see a legacy that you never could have imagined if you just if you just run a path of self serving ministry. And uh, that was the kindest thing that, that anyone could have said to me. And, and uh, that kind of started the journey. So at 21 years old, I'd start, I did a worship camp. And, uh, and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was terrible at it. I mean, I, I made, 
so many mistakes. Like, I should probably be in jail. Like, I didn't do anything like that unethical, but I think about the amount of mistakes I made and things that I did that was unwise. But, but, but I, I took that, that, that message to heart, and, and the Lord, in the midst of this camp that probably should have been an unmitigated disaster, uh, the Lord took it, and he breathed, and he, and he blessed it. Um, and uh, I ran. We actually did these camps for about four or five years. I worked under uh, actually a guy who was here at the conference named Zach Hensley, uh, who, uh, <clears throat> who, who we ran with for years, and we saw... To this day, actually, Gretchen Schmidt in the back, she went to that worship camp as a teenager. Um, almost everywhere I go, I run into people that were like, man, I came to that camp and the Lord spoke or encountered me. Or, and thank you so much. And, you know, people at, at Bethel and Jesus Culture and Hillsong and at different worship places all over the earth from a dorky kid who didn't know what he was doing and made tons of mistakes. But but I was like, man, you know what? I I, I buy into this principle of, of discipleship. And uh, in our culture, though, we, we don't buy into making Jesus following disciples. Like, we, we, we really don't. And uh, <clears throat> I, I had recently, I, I would have said, yeah, you know, I love making disciples. I love discipleship. And I got my world blown up a little bit about two months ago. I uh, went to Malaysia. I got invited to go, Pastor Lee, uh, mentioned it, but there was a group of Iranian pastors, uh, which Iran is the fastest growing church in the world. And there's a group of about 50 of their main pastors that twice a year, sorry, uh, once every other year, they get them out of the country. They have to get them out like really secretively and they regather in another location. They have a, a three-day retreat. And so I, wa- I want you to know like what things... Um, what, what things they talk about on their retreats. Like when we go out on our retreats, like we were like, okay, what, you know, how are our mailers looking? What's happening with social media? Their retreats were, okay, what happens in your, in your church when they arrest and kill uh, you? You know, is your, what's your contingency plan for that? They, they, their retreat was centered around asking these questions because obviously they're in a, this persecuted nation. And uh, a friend of mine, mutual friend of mine named Dalton, who plants churches in, uh, in the Middle East, he's like, hey, I'll, I'll set you up with this guy. He's like, he has about 5,000 churches in Iran, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in a place where it is completely illegal, and, and, and the, the pace at which it's growing. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course I want to meet with this guy. And then and I met with him, and uh, <laughs> he was very intense. And uh, my flesh was, was really offended, but to be honest, I mean, and I don't know how you couldn't have, but, but he, uh, he, uh, he kind of went on to the ne- for the next hour and just kind of ripped the church in America crazy hard. <laughs> like, I won't even fully go into it, and, and, uh, but, but it was good. It was a, it was a rebuke I needed. You know, uh, Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 says, you know, it, it prays like, that you would be strengthened with might by your spirit in the inner man. And we love to pray that scripture. And we think like, oh, get strengthened with might. Like we think we're going to get zapped by like kind of the strength lightning bolt from God. You know what that, that Greek word means? It means the tearing and the rebuilding of a muscle. So when we ask for God to strengthen us with might, we are asking for a tearing to happen, but then to be rebuilt in strength. And, and that to me represents why we need to receive uh, intense prophetic messages, especially from people in other contexts that are outside of ours, but that are, that are really bearing fruit. And so I knew it was going to be hard. He was challenging me, but he said something revolutionary that, that I would have told you that I believed, but, but the way I saw it with, with total clarity. And, uh, and he asked me, he's like, hey, in America, um, you know, how many, how many leaders, let, let's just do leaders of, of mega churches that have fallen morally in the past year. And I said, well, I, I know of about five. It's probably about five to 10. Um, he's like, how many leaders that you know, maybe not mega churches, that you know personally in the last five years who have walked away from the Lord? And I said, probably close to 50 or 100. And he's like, of our, our 6,000 churches, he's like, he's like, you know how many moral failings we've had? Zero. You know how many people have denied Jesus in the face of death or being raped or put in prison? And he goes, he asked me a question. 
And he says, how do you measure maturity? When Jesus says, make disciples, how do you measure maturity? And he goes, I don't know a single church. I mean, this is intense language. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying I, I, I fully agree with the, I just, I don't want to soften the blow, to be honest, because it, it was so convicting. He goes, I don't know a single church or organization that doesn't measure maturity by gifting and knowledge. He said, you know why you've had those 5, 10 megachurch pastors, why those 50 to 100 people have fallen is because we evaluate how mature and how ready for leadership people are with their knowledge, how much they know, and how gifted they are. And if they are gifted and they know the language and they know the talk and they know the leadership culture, we will throw them right up on a platform, whether or not they have the character to sustain it. And he's like, but, but how do you measure? He's like, you measure maturity by knowledge and gifting. We measure maturity by obedience. To the level that they are obedient is the direct level of how mature they are. They go, it does not matter how gifted they are. I met, I met with, with, this, with this guy, one of these pastors, and I met with him. It's somebody that was, ex- to be honest, he was extremely unimpressive. There was not, he didn't have a great look. He wasn't crazy sharp with words. He, he had awkward mannerisms. And, and uh, I met with him, and then uh, and we, had a, we had a great meeting, but... Met nothing, nothing that you impress. If he got up on, on stage at the Arise Sign conference, you would get bored. You'd get on Instagram. You wouldn't listen to what he had, had to say, probably. Walked away, and he goes, uh, that guy's personally led over 1,000 people to Christ <laughs> and uh, has started a, and is over about, uh, about 200 churches. And I, 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 I'm sorry, but that man would sit in almost any congregation in America and be completely unseen and unnoticed. But they measured his ability to lead by the obedience in his heart. And we have produced really gifted, really talented, powerless Christians. Powerless Christians that, that talk the talk, that look really good, that are really good at hosting. Stuff. And, and listen, I, I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm obviously, we're part of this conference, and I believe in excellence. I'm, I'm going to talk about how that serves. But if we get this out of order, and I believe in America, we have this dramatically out of order. And the Holy Spirit took me and showed me people that I said I was discipling. And uh, just going to be vulnerable with you. And, and he showed me these people, and I, there was moments where I was meeting with these people, and I was pouring, and I was sharing Bible verses and revelation, and I knew in my spirit, one, they were not growing, two, they were not producing fruit, and three, there was probably rebellion in their life, but I had not poked or asked any questions to reveal that, and I had hoped that by feeding them knowledge, I would fix the problem. Guys, we in the West are cursed with knowledge. It is a curse. When I went to Iran, there were pastors and leaders that had unbelievable authority, were leading so many people to Jesus, had a character that looked more like Jesus than almost anyone I'd ever met. They didn't own a Bible, and they knew probably 20 Bible verses. When they came to this retreat, when they had someone preach and teach, he would translate this Iranian pastor, and they would, they would say something, and he'd be like, I'm not going to tell them that. They don't know what that is. That'll confuse them, and uh, so don't say that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's like really harsh. And so someone was preaching, and he was using an example of the prosperity gospel, <laughs> and uh, he wasn't saying it in a positive sense, but he goes, they don't know what the prosperity gospel is. He's like, that would be so confusing. They would, that, he's like, they don't know how to deal with that. Move on. And, and I was like, man, that was kind of like harsh how he told him off and he goes he says to me he's like no you don't understand he's like you in the west you guys teach sermon series after sermon series scripture after scripture and and there's so much knowledge and and good information he's like these people the moment they hear or read a scripture they will reorder their life to completely submit to that if they hear a scripture, they don't think, oh, wow, that's really insightful. That's a really good point. Boy, I wonder, you know, man, that's really cool. I need to think on that a little bit. 
No, they get on their face and they repent for all the areas of their life that don't align with what Jesus said. And, and honestly, I think that that environment is so much more conducive because Jesus did not come and he did not download to the disciples about the cross and, and the resurrection right away. He didn't say, I want you to go to seminary for four years and then after you really know the scriptures and know the Bible, I want you to then come and follow me. No, he went to the uneducated. He went to the ones who the other rabbis didn't want. The reason they were doing fish, they were fishermen or tax collectors or whatever is because they weren't wanted by the rabbis. They they weren't the gifted knowledge ones that would excel like they would in the church in America. And he goes, I want to go to these guys. They know nothing, but I'm not going to lead with information and knowledge. I'm going to ask them one question. Will you follow me? Will you lay everything down and follow me? And then the way he spoke, it was progressive. He only taught to the level that they had the capacity to obey. And we in the West, we in a day and we push so much knowledge and then we measure the ability to regurgitate that knowledge is how we define who our leaders are and who we need to give authority. And we've produced powerless Christians and beyond that, we have lost all discernment of who has authority and who does not. We look at what is impressive to man rather than who actually has Authority from heaven. I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> I was at this conference that, that we were playing, we were leading worship at, and I, we hadn't played yet, and I saw someone, and, and I was like, I got a prophetic word for them. And I, I shared the word over them, and I thought, it was, I thought it was really on, and they went, oh, man, that's awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> that same person came up to me the next day, and they go, Oh my gosh, I had no idea you wrote the song Reckless Love. Oh my God, I love that song so much. Oh, that man, now what you said, that, whoa, oh man, that really hits me now. And, and <laughs> I, I, there was something, I, I, I honestly, I wanted to vomit. And that is such an unbelievably accurate picture of what happens. When, when I was just, an everyday person right there, the word had everything to do with the size of my stage, not the accuracy and power of what was being released through that. And then all of a sudden, because they found out that I wrote a song that millions of people sing, then all of a sudden that word is powerful. That, that is so jacked up. It's, it's so jacked up. And when we hear scripture and revelation we are tantalized by it in our mind, but we don't apply it in our lives. We don't live it out. And they say, I rearrange my life for this. And then I, I watch as people that we disciple fall away. And, and I, I got to sit on an interview of a, of a woman. This is going to be kind of intense. <clears throat> but they asked her in this interview, this is his pastor's wife, and she is leading people to Jesus at a rate you wouldn't believe. And they asked her, and they said, what does it mean to be persecuted? What does that mean for you? And she said, I know that if I just lived a quiet Christian life and I kept my faith to myself, I wouldn't have any trouble. The only issue that the government of Iran will have and and." you know, possible jihadist. It only has to do with when I share my faith. And she goes, she said this, she said, I know that most likely at some point in my life, I will be raped. Because that is what they do to Christian women who share their faith. And she said, Jesus, whew, Jesus gave up his body as a living sacrifice for me. What is 15 minutes of rape compared to an eternity with Jesus? And how could I be silent? <sighs> and Monsieur, that pastor, he said, do you see that woman? He said, the Lord used me, or used that, that woman. He said, see, see, Jesus appeared to her in the flesh. 
And if she were a convert due to a message, she would fall away. Because she encountered me, she will die for me. She says, in the West, we, in the West, what you do is, is you convert to disciple. And converts will fold the moment there's any pressure. It says, but disciples, if they've encountered me, if they encounter God, they will die for me. And uh, this is crazy. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm delivering it. You do what you do with it. I had to wrestle with this, so now you have to wrestle with it. He goes, if someone comes to me and says, lead me to Jesus, I ask them, I was like, well, has Jesus made himself known to you? And if they say no, he says no. <laughs> he says, I want you to go back and I want you to ask him if he's actually real. When he speaks to you or shows up, then I'll, then I'll talk with you. And uh, that, that's probably really offensive to a lot of people. But here's what they do. They share a story about the gospel and they have to be secretive because they can't be, co they can't be overt about the gospel because they could get arrested and anybody could be secret police. But they share a general story and they say, what does this teach you about God? What does this teach you about yourself? If it's true, then what will you change about your life? And for who will you tell? And this is crazy. But they will not talk or meet with them again unless they do the obedience point and unless they tell somebody. Why? Because they said, if, if, this is about, if this is about knowledge, it'll fold in a moment. But if they take this and they obey, through the, the, the door of obedience makes way for the supernatural. Every pastor I talked to that had been saved in, in these Iranian pastors, every one of them had seen Jesus in the flesh, had heard him audibly, or had some insane encounter with him. And why? Because they heard the word and they obeyed, and through their obedience, the door for the miraculous was open. They encountered Jesus, a real person who they would die for. And Jesus to them is not a religion. It's not about how much they can know. It is a person that they will follow to the ends of the earth because he is real. And if they hear anything, <clears throat> if they hear anything of a command of Jesus, they will reorder and reorganize their life. There is one metric and metric alone to measure maturity, and that's obedience. That's it. And what happens is when we use gifting and we only elevate gifting, and unfortunately, this can happen the most with worship teams and, 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 and worship leaders. And because why? Because the giftings actually is required. And, and so I, I'm not dogging gifting. Gifting is a very important part of who you are. Hear me. And, and Jesus wants you to serve it, but he wants it in the right order. But we throw the people on stage who are the most gifted, whether or not they're obedient. And what happens is we, we produce seedless fruit because we haven't made disciples of them, so they don't make disciples of any, anybody. And the expression of Christianity that we say is it's a service on a weekend, and that's it. And the worship is so valuable. And, and you'll hear lots of sermons and messages. I'm, again, I'm not dogging worship or the power of worship. But, but ultimately, if we want power and authority, what we're doing as worship leaders and people who lead worship teams is that we are called to make disciples. And we, we have to, we have to rethink the way that we evaluate and we give leadership and, and, and who we give authority to and who has authority. And we need to look with different eyes because we have created a system. And, and I don't hate the system. My, my, the goal is not to throw that out. Listen, we have an insane advantage that they actually don't have in Iran, which is called we can gather around the presence of God. That's what they don't have. They can't gather. When they, when they gather in meetings, uh, well, in Malaysia, they were all shouting the whole time. They're like, this sucks. This is the worst worship service I've been a part of. Like, stop shouting. Like, start singing. And then as I walked away, one of the women said, that was amazing. She's like, I haven't been able to, to shout or sing for two years. And so to be able to have this freedom is so amazing. And uh, we take that for granted. We can gather around the presence of God. That corporate encounter we can have that on a weekly basis. We have such an advantage. I'm not saying throw that expression out because that expression is massively valuable. However, we can't just celebrate good services and be like, man, the job's done. 
But at the same time, we don't need to feel the burden that we have to disciple every single person ourselves. We can't. Honestly, I think you can disciple probably about three if you're, you know, medium capacity, 12 if you have just insane Jesus capacity. I think that's about how many people you can disciple at once. I, I think that's, that's realistically a, the number. But, but as we produce disciples, the only way to actually produce disciples that produce fruit is for them to disciple other people. But it starts at the top. And it, it, it's, we don't have to have brilliant strategies. We really don't. I love brilliant strategies. I love brilliant ideas. I like amazing songs. I, I do all that stuff. I, I love it all. But, but we, what happens is you come to a conference like this a lot of times, and you're probably from a smaller church, and you see an LED wall, and you see lights, and you worship that sounds amazing, and it's well-tuned, whatever, and you're like, wow, that's so powerful. I could never produce that kind of fruit where I'm at. And that is such bull crap right from, the, right from the, the pit of hell. These people that don't have any of that are producing more fruit than almost any ministry that I know in the West because it's measured by obedience. How obedient are we? He's not going to ask us if we had the most amazing sounding worship ministry in the world. He's going to say, what did I command you to do and did you do it? And we let confusion dominate us. We get so confused because we, we, we're, we follow every other church. and like, oh, man, that's better than us. That's better than us. That's better than us. And eventually we're just like, oh, we're so heavy. We're like, we're terrible. Like, because <laughs> because we, we, we live in this comparison world. And the Lord's like, don't look to the left and the right. It's not confusing. It, it might be hard, but, but it's simple. It's insanely simple. It's as simple as just following Jesus and, and what he said. But, but we don't want to follow him, and so we try to fill that void with lots of knowledge, with lots of talent, with lots of gifting. And we make it so confusing. That's why somebody who knows 20 Bible verses can look way more like Jesus than people who know the Bible from start to finish. Kind of sounds a lot like the Pharisees, huh? Man, they knew the Bible really well, didn't they? They knew the sermon series. They knew, the, they knew how to work that religious system. Woo, they had it down pat. And Jesus said, you know, who you, you know who you're making disciples of? Your father, the devil. You know what Jesus did? He grabbed 12 super unimpressive dudes. He told them to, to forsake everything and follow him. And then he spent three years with them, pouring out his heart, dealing with their crap, letting them make mistakes. <laughs> you know, Mark, Mark talked about it so well. And those 12 men were unimpressive, ungifted, and whatever, and they changed the world. They turned the world upside down. I think Jesus was trying to tip us off to something. I think Jesus was trying to say, the point is not like, okay, now we look past talented people and just go after untalented people. Like, no, Jesus loves the, the, the three, you know, the five, or sorry, the two, the one, two, and five, or two, five, and ten, depending on which. He loves every, it has nothing to do with the level of talent that they have. It has to do with the submission of the Holy Spirit and who he highlights. And the Spirit highlighted 12 people, and he went to them. You know, but they weren't the only ones who had the invitation. You know the difference between those 12? That, you know, what are the 12 disciples' names? Shout them out. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, John, Judas, Simon, Bartholomew. Awesome, I think we got them all. What's the name of the rich young ruler? Did Jesus, who, did Jesus give him an offer to let him follow him? Yeah. Same offer to the other 12. What's the difference? They didn't obey. And you never know his name. I believe that Jesus gives that call to every believer. And the level of authority and power that you walk in doesn't have to do with the, are you a two, five, or 10 talent person? It has to do with the level of obedience in your heart. Jesus said to Peter, hey, leave behind your fish, fishing business come follow me. What does it say? I don't think he sold those boats. I think those boats are probably still sitting here today. He sold it all. He gave it all up and he followed Jesus. The point isn't perfection, it's maturity. You guys probably know the, 
the word teleos. It's a Greek word. It's translated perfect in the Bible a lot, but probably a better translation is fully mature. He's not looking for perfect people. And, and your, your worship team and your people, they don't have to be perfect. They need to be mature. And how do you measure maturity? Obedience. But we kind of overwhelm everyone, right? Like, you have to rule at like 50 things. And, and, and then everyone's like, well, forget it. I can't do that. And that's not how the Lord moves and speaks. We have, we have one mouth and we're made in the image of God. We can only say one thing at a time. Jesus has one mouth. Jesus can only say one thing at a time. How does the enemy speak, though? You know, I love it how they portray it on, you know, videos and movies and, and what happens when confusion comes in our life. What happens? <laughs> million voices, overwhelming confusion. That's how the enemy operates. The Lord operates in insane clarity. One mouth, one word at a time, and within that word, the grace and power to fulfill that command exists. And we say, oh, if we just knew more, if we were just more talented or more gifted, no, that's not true. Jesus speaks, and within every word he speaks, the power exists to fulfill that command. But you have to make a decision, no matter what he says, I'm going to obey and follow him. And I just met with 50 pastors that changed my life because at every turn, whether or not their comfort says they can, they will follow Jesus to the ends of the earth. I'll give you one short example of that. The guy went up to... <clears throat> this pastor I met, he went up to a, a group of gang members in Iran. They're sitting around a fire, and he goes, I want to tell you a story about a man. Do you want to hear it? The gang leader looks at him, and he goes, yeah, I'll hear it. But if I don't like it, I'm going to rape you in front of all these men. Do you still want to tell that story? And he goes, yeah, I do. He shares the, the story from the scripture, and then at the end, he goes, oh, yeah, by the way, the reason you're in this gang is because when you're nine years old, you came home from school, your mom locked you out, and you've been on the streets. And the Lord wants you to know, I didn't do that. I'm your father. The guy breaks down, weeps. Every single gang member gets saved and starts a church. <laughs> that, the reason, man, man, the reason we don't walk on that water, right? The reason we don't see those miracles because we don't step out in that level of faith. But why... He had confidence. Why? Because he's like, the Lord told me to share that. It has nothing to do with his threat or what he says. If the Lord told me to do it, then I'm to obey. And who am I to say? And even if, you know, the, even if the Lord does not deliver me, we will not bow to any other idol because we serve one master and one master alone. That level of clarity and that precision of mission, it's Man, it's not because of superior training. We have all the same tools. We have the same Holy Spirit. But we have to start from a place of complete submission and complete obedience. I want to read a couple scriptures and, uh, about obedience. And I've really, uh, <clears throat> I was tested in this as well because I come to these workshops and, and I, I teach worship, you know, for a living. I, I run our worship school. And so I, when I come to these conferences, I feel the same thing. I, Caleb, you got to wow them. You gotta, you gotta show them all the right things and they gotta be like, Caleb, you're so brilliant, you're so amazing. And, and that thing in you wants to just give into that. And this morning, the Lord just said, Caleb, I want you to talk about obedience. I'm like, but I got really good stuff. I want you to talk about obedience. But God, do you know how good my content is? I want you to talk about obedience. I'm like, okay, Lord. You know the skater company Obey? <clears throat> Obedience is a dirty word in culture. If you say the word obedience, you know what culture thinks of? Ignorant, stupid, simple, you're a pawn, you're a tool. I, I pulled this off the website of this company called Obey. It's basically mocking any, anyone who holds any dogmatic view. It says, Obey, you guys know the skater company Obey. And if you, if you look, if you like this, the you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not, my point is not to like, let's have an obey burning party after this, guys. Let's get them. Like, it's obviously not my point, but I want to point to something. The obey meaning is rooted in do it yourself countercultural, counterculture of punk rock and skateboarding, but it's also taking cues from popular culture, commercial marketing, and political messaging. Uh, Fer Ferry, is that his name? Jake, what's his name? 
I said it, Ferry. Ferry steeps his ideology and iconograph in self-empowerment. With biting sarcasm verging on reverse psychology, he goads viewers using the imperative obey to take heed of the propaganda and to bend the world into their agendas. Self-empowerment is that word they use in that. The word the world thinks of obey and they think ignorant, simple, robot, pawn. Because you know what? Successful ministry, the world can kind of get down to that, right? Like I, I, I experienced that a little bit. Like, <clears throat> you know, my, my dad, his whole side of the family, most all of them aren't saved, you know? And when I'm doing stuff in, in like ministry, you know, the wild stuff, like they think it's weird. They hate it. Like if I'm fasting, they think I'm a freak, you know? If I go on a mission trip, what the heck is wrong with you? You're putting yourself in danger. But you know what? When I write a song that's Grammy nominated, woo! We share his post. We love our cousin Caleb. He's the best. <laughs> the successes, the, the making money, all of those things, the world celebrates all of that. But the world doesn't get down with obedience. When we start using, wait a minute, whoa, obey? Obedience? <clears throat> World thinks ignorant, simple, robot, pawn. They might think submission or oppression. They might associate it with, you know, a member of the political party, out, you know, in the opposite aisle. And, and I have a couple words that the Bible associates with obedience. Love, freedom, prosperity, leadership, authenticity, I just want to read a couple of these scriptures. It's littered all throughout our scriptures. We know it's there. We just prefer to skip past it to the more stuff that we feel like fits our climate better. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. What's Jesus saying? I'm waiting to make my home with the obedient. John 15, 14, if you love me, you will build a powerful worship ministry. If you love me, you'll write a Grammy-nominated song, right? No. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 2, 1 through 6, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Freedom. I love this one. Why? Because the world looks at obedience as bondage. They see us being obedient and they're like, there's some invisible sub a dictator that you are just blindly submitting to. That's bondage. I live however I want, baby. I'm free. Woo, I can make my own choices, my own decisions. This is amazing. Guess what? They're not free. They're crippled, crippled by anxiety, crippled by depression. They are... a addicts that they cannot escape out of a prison while they're celebrating their freedom. And they look at somebody and they say, <laughs> look out on their bondage. And they're filled with self-control and the fruit of the spirit. They are free. Listen to these scriptures about freedom. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Sounds like freedom. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. For just as though the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. Through Jesus' obedience is why you were made righteous. Why are we trying to make others righteous in anything other than our own obedience? It was Jesus' submission to the Father. You know how much talent and gifting it took Jesus to die on the cross? None. You know how much obedience it took? Everything. Father, if at all possible, take this cup, but not my will. Yours be done. Obedience. The reason why you are walking in freedom today is because one man's obedience. He said no to Satan said, I'll give you the stage. I'll give you everything you want and you won't even have to go to the cross. You can just worship me. I feel like the enemy can come, and I know this sounds intense, he can come to the church in America and say, hey, 
Guess what? Hey, psst. You know how Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me? Well, guess what? Psst, come over here. I got a deal for you. Hey, if you just don't do that cross thing, I got something for you. All the, all the nations of the world will bow down to you. I'll give you everything that God promised, but you won't have to go through the cross. And Jesus, of course, said, absolutely not. But Jesus, or sorry, the enemy can come to us, and he's afraid of us. Why? Because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because we are the light of the world. Because we have the answer to what the world is looking for. But Satan goes, hey, Come over here. What if I give you really successful life? What if I give you comfort? What if I give you the house you always wanted, the wife you always wanted, the, the life you always wanted? And guess what? You don't have to do that cross thing. You don't, have to, you don't have to live obedient. And we settle. Rather than going to the cross and through one man's obedience, the world receives righteousness. Through our obedience, the world re reaps a harvest that we could never do in our own gifting and ability. And listen, God wants your gifting and ability. This is not a trash your gifting message. I'm saying we got to reorder this. We have to. Guys, I, I, I can't keep doing it. I can't keep signing on to social media and seeing the next megachurch pastor or worship leader in an affair or, or, or falling away from the faith or, or whatever else because we had no idea who actually had authority because we're not looking to see who's producing fruit because we call fruit the size of ministry, not, not actually the fruits of the spirit being produced in the people we are discipling. You want to look at the fruit of somebody? Look at the people they're in closest relationship with. That's fruit. Are they producing fruit? And are we producing fruit on our teams and what we have? Are we submitted to the Holy Spirit and what he's saying? <clears throat> Measure maturity through obedience and obedience alone. Here's the crazy thing is, is when you, I know I'm saying some intense things and, and it can feel intense, and the enemy will try to come with condemnation and confusion in this moment and, and lie. And I feel that in this room right now. I knew it was going to come against it. And here's, here's what's amazing is in the kindness of the Lord, one, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the answer is so simple. A child can do it. In fact, the very definition of a child and their first beginning stages is that they are fully obedient on parents, the Lord literally set it up within family for us to understand before we can produce anything, we got to learn to obey. Hey, before you can learn to like, you know, hit a baseball or crunch a spreadsheet number or whatever, you got to learn that you can't touch the stove. <laughs> you can't run with scissors. You got to eat the right food, you know, the simple points of obedience and we start in that place, but then we're enticed by knowledge. We're enticed by gifting. Why are we enticed by it? Because it offers a crossless, obedience-less solution. If I can trick people into thinking that I'm successful and that my ministry is awesome without having to obey, my flesh loves that crap. My flesh loves that. Because it's hard. <laughs> but it's not confusing. It's insanely simple. We just have to obey. You're not called to do so many of the things that we put ourselves, we put pressure on ourselves to do. We're just called to do the last thing he said. You know what I, you know what I say to someone who goes, Caleb, I, I just can't hear his voice. I always say, well, what's, what's the last thing he said to you? And they tell me, I said, well, have you obeyed that? You know what the answer is every single time? No. Lord's like, why would I give you more information and knowledge? I gave you a command and the power to exist, and your freedom exists within that command. You just got to do it. It's, cra it's crazy simple, guys. It really is. But it requires a, a, such a radical surrender that... But I, I, I think for us in, in the worship world, and the reason I went to Malaysia is because, look, the... The landscape of this country is changing fast, if you haven't figured that out. 
<laughs> like, it's not cool to be a Christian anymore. I don't know if you figured that out. Like, it went from being like we were celebrated to, to being outsiders and, and outcasts. And I'm not really worried about it, to be honest, because <laughs> the Lord has an answer and a solution, and it is a victorious solution. And, and, and I'm starting to have a greater distaste for living in apathy and lethargy than I have a distaste for pain and, uncom- and discomfort. It's rising up inside of me. And you know what? The Lord is looking for people who can voluntarily choose to suffer now so in the day when it's involuntary, they don't fall away. You know, you know who falls away in the day of pressure? The people who are surprised by it. Why are they surprised by it? Because they haven't been placed with a challenge. You know what? But when I wake up in the morning and I have a challenge, and my challenge for the day is, Caleb, I want you to teach on obedience. And most likely, a fourth of the room is going to leave and not really like you. And they're like, I didn't like that guy. He was mean and shouty and cried. It was super awkward. <laughs> did he, well, did he give you any practicals? No. No, he didn't. My flesh is like, oh, I got the solution to that. But I got to die to myself and I got to die to, the, to what you think about me. And if you impress me and you think I'm cool and, and, and I don't get to even ask, did it go well or not? Like we asked that with worship. Like how was worship? Was worship good? Or how was your workshop? Was it good? We don't need to ask, was it good? We need to ask, were we obedient? Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Jesus says, I was faithful to everything the Father gave me. The, the, the question is, didn't, it's not, did I do good? It's, was I faithful? Did he give me a word and I did it? Whether they hate me and stone me or whether they love me and that those, those can flux. But before the Lord, I stand before him and I'm saying, God, was I obedient to what you said? Did I follow what you had to say? I don't care what they think and if they think it's amazing or not. And I, I want to challenge us in, in this place. I want to challenge us. I have been challenging you. <laughs> in, in this place, can we, can we step outside of what's normal? And, and, and just, just to give one more qualifier, what could happen? We can come out of this and we can want to like, you know, like, well, let's blow everything up. Let's stop doing church. And uh, guys, that is, that is, that is not the solution and answer that because, because the services, the gifting, those things are not the problem. It's what we have ordered as the problem. And this might sound heavy, but it is not nearly as heavy as trying to build a ministry on something that God did not tell you to do. There is no weight like that weight. But his burden, it's light and it's easy. It's a yoke you have to obey, but it's light. It's joyful. There's there's the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Yes, I got to die to myself for a moment, but there's everlasting life and fruit on the other side of it. Go ahead and stand. I just want to ask you, we still have some time before this workshop is done. The Lord's not looking for you to change a million things in this moment. It's typically the enemy or our flesh that tries to do that. Most likely the Lord is just looking for one response. It's probably one thing he's bringing you back to. For some of you, you're re-remembering something the Lord has commanded that you've forgotten. You're re-remembering who he's made you to be and who you are. For others, there is an area of your life, you're like, I have not surrendered that and I am not walking in obedience in that area. I want to wait on the Holy Spirit for about 30 seconds because I don't know. I don't know what's going on in your inner world, but the Holy Spirit does. He knows. And I don't know what the revelation is, but I do know that the Holy Spirit wants to bring us to a new level of surrender. So Holy Spirit, we just wait on you. I want you to imagine you're Peter. Jesus has just stepped into your boat. You've just gone into the deep and you've just caught a supernatural catch that you could have never done in your own strength. And Jesus just says two words to you, follow me. Follow me.
Jesus, we repent for going after knowledge and not revelation. God, we repent for trying to trying to produce something on our own strength beyond just what you have commanded us and called us to do. Lord, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Lord, you promised clarity and a sound mind. I speak to every mind that has come in with confusion and heaviness. I bind confusion and heaviness by the power of the cross right now in the name of Jesus. Confusion, go in the name of Jesus. Jesus never leads with confusion, ever. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Two out of three of those are felt realities. God, right now, in the presence of your Holy Spirit, I ask for the peace and the joy of heaven to fill our hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Every assignment of the enemy that tries to come with heaviness or discouragement, go in the name of Jesus. God, I ask for the peace that comes from knowing that we're yours and that we're beloved. I ask for the peace that comes with the simplicity of knowing that we are fully obedient and submitted to you. And I ask for the joy of the Lord that's our strength. I ask for a real authentic joy, God, not joy that comes from temporary happiness from circumstance, but joy that comes from a life that's submitted to the indwelling and the power of the Holy Spirit, that's submitted to the words of God, that's submitted to the leadership of Jesus. What the world says is bondage, you call liberty. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. God, I ask for freedom right now in this room where there has been heaviness. God, I ask for freedom from addiction, freedom from discouragement, freedom from hopelessness, freedom from heaviness right now in the name of Jesus. God, freedom from false assumptions of what we are supposed to do that you never told us to do. God's false burdens that other people or we have put on ourselves that you never put on us. I ask for a lifting of the heavy yoke, a lifting of disappointment. Some of you are disappointed about things that you haven't succeeded in that Jesus hasn't even asked you to do or be successful in. Jesus says, I I don't care how successful your fishing business was. I want you to follow me. Right now, I ask for a fresh infilling of that spirit. God, we ask for grace to trust you and to obey and to follow you. God, for our ministries. God, that we would produce fruit that remains and fruit that lasts. God, give us the grace to have the difficult conversation that we've been putting off, but we know we'll produce fruit on the other side. God, give us grace to confront the sin that we don't want to, but we know that Maybe freedom and deliverance exists on the other side. God, give us grace to love our people well and to have patience like Jesus. God, give us grace to care more about the people that God has put right in front of us than the end result of numbers and, and things that we so quickly look to. God, help us measure success with the right metrics, God. Realign our hearts. God, draw us to that place of obedience, Lord. And God, we ask for that Church of America, God, that we would, that we would unify, God, around not on knowledge and information, how much we know, but by, by how obedient we are. God, that we would follow the church and the persecuted world, God, that we would follow you even to the ends of the earth, Jesus. We love you, we worship you, and trust you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.